Welcome to Code Report. I'm your host, Connor Hookstra. The green screen is back. I've been living in Airbnbs for the past three months as I transitioned from Canada down to Silicon Valley, which is why there has been no green screen. But now that I've settled in, we are back to normal. I'd like to highlight one comment from the past week, which was from Michael Lacander on the LeetCode Contest 99 Problem 2 video. In my time complexity analysis, I stated that the time complexity was big O of T times N log N. And he pointed out that for the Java solution, this is actually incorrect because the plus equal operator on the Java string actually has linear time complexity, whereas in C++, if you're plus equaling uh, just a single character, it's only constant. Uh, so, uh, in fact, the time complexity for the Java solution is actually big O of T times N squared. So thank you to Michael for pointing this out. I really appreciate it when you guys uh, catch my mistakes. It helps me learn and it also uh, helps you guys learn uh, from reading the comments. So thanks so much. Taking a look at the contest that we had last week, we only had the one contest from Leak Code, Contest 100, on Saturday evening. Taking a look at the top 10 leaderboard, uh, for the one contest we had, we had Hank55663 in first, uh, notably Yui in second, and in third, Yubo Wenok. In today's video, we're going to be covering problem three from Leak Code Contest 100 entitled Bitwise Ors of Subarrays. The problem states we have an array A of non-negative integers. For every contiguous subarray, we take the bitwise or of all the elements in B, obtaining a result AI bitwise or or ai plus 1 all the way to bitwise or aj. And the question is asking us to return the number of unique possible results. Uh, in other words, results that occur more than once are only counted once in the final answer. And note that for this problem, uh, the length of our array is going to be between 1 and 50,000, or 5 times 10 to the 4th. And the values uh, in our elements, in our array, are going to be between 0 and 10 to the 9th. So let's take a look at an example that leak code provided us with to understand a little bit more what this problem is asking for. So here's our example. Uh, it gives us the array 1, 2, 4, and the output should be 6. And basically it's telling us that the unique values we can get from taking the bitwise or of all of the unique subarrays are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7. So what that means is we first need to uh, take each of the subarrays and then perform a bitwise OR operation on all the elements in each one of those subarrays and then uh, keep track of the unique resulting values. Um, so what does this look like? Uh, we start by taking the subarrays and so uh, that's going to consist of each of the elements individually because that is a subarray unto itself and then the first two elements, the last two elements, and all of the elements. So that gives us 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 2, 4, and 1, 2, 4. The next step, uh, we do this implicitly when in our code, but we're going to show it ex explicitly for the sake of explaining this problem. We convert these decimal values into uh, binary values. So for those not similar, uh, not familiar with binary, uh, basically what this is, is it's base 2, so you take each of the bits in your binary number, and whenever a uh, bit is set to 1, you're going to take the 2 and the index of your bit, and uh, take your 2 and raise that to the power of the index, and then uh, add that to your decimal number. So for 101, we have 1 in our 0th index, so we take 2 to the power of 0, which is 1, and we're going to add that. Uh, this bit is 0, so we don't need to worry about it. We're basically, the 0 is going to 0 this out. And for our uh, bit at our second index, we have a 1, so we end up with 2 to the power of 2, which is 4. So we end up with 4 plus 1 is equal to 5. So that's basically how binary works. Um, and the next step is to take the bitwise or of each of these sort of binary numbers. Um, and the way that works is, for those that aren't familiar with a bitwise or, when you have two binary numbers, basically, uh, if a bit is 1 in either of the two binary numbers, uh, you set that bit to 1 in the resulting binary number. So here we have a 1 in the first binary 
binary number and then a zero here, so that results in one. A zero here and a one here, that results in one, but two zeros results in a zero. So at least as long as you have one bit that is a one, it is one in the resulting binary number. So you can see here that's exactly what's happening. Each of the individual uh, elements is just itself, but here we end up with zero one one. Here we end up with one one zero, and for all of the elements, because they each have a uh, different bit set, we end up with one one one. And so when we convert these back to decimal, just so we can see that they're not equal uh, very easily, this gives us six distinct values. So in this example, we don't actually have any duplicate resulting values from the bitwise or operations. Um, but in other examples you will. So we're going to use a hash set to store these values uh, and then it, once we've computed them all we can just return the size of our hash set. So I'm going to skip to the code now. The way I approached this problem was just originally trying to brute force it because it's unclear whether uh, 5 times 10 to the 4 given a quadratic algorithm is going to time out because leak code doesn't really provide how many seconds in each problem uh, you're given to solve this problem. So I approached that. It initially uh, timed out, but then I was able to optimize it to get it to pass. So let's take a look at the code. So here is our solution. Our function subarray bitwise ors takes a vector of integers a, and it returns an int the number of unique resulting bitwise ors, uh, bitwise or values from our subarrays. So the first thing we do is we declare a hash set in C++, that's unordered set of integers. Uh, we're just declaring a local here n to be the size of our array. And then we have uh, two uh, for loops here. So nested for loops, uh, i represents the start in index of our subarray and j uh, represents the ending index of our subarray. Uh, so what's that? what that means is uh, we're basically taking every single pair of values as the beginning and end of our subarrays which is going to generate every single subarray. Um, and so inside our first loop we initialize our sort of running bitwise value and that's going to be x and we initialize that to be the first value in our array and then we're going to start our second loop uh, at 1 plus this value so that we're not bitwising, uh, bitwise oring itself which wouldn't really change but it's just a little less inefficient a little less efficient and uh, we're making sure to insert uh, this value here because as mentioned before a value itself does account does count as a subarray and so then once we enter our uh, for loop here, we are going to do a bitwise or. So this this pipe or bar, if you want to refer to it. Oh, note, I glazed over the 4i and 4j as seen before in previous videos. These are just two macros uh, representing our for loops. And uh, this pipe equals is uh, the same thing as this here. So x is equal to x pipe uh, a of j. So this is just your bitwise or uh, operator. So when you have... Uh, two uh, pipes or two bars, it's a logical OR, and when you only have one, it's a bitwise OR. And so once we do this, we have our sort of running uh, bitwise OR at this point, and then we insert the value again. So if it's a new value, it'll get kept track, and then we continue to do this. And at the end, um, we can output our size. So unfortunately, this times out because it is a quadratic time complexity, and I guess for 5 times 10 to the 4th, that uh, is too much. Um, but the first optimization that I tried uh, was I noted that um, there's going to be sort of a maximum value for x that we might hit. So due to the fact that our uh, values in our vector are constrained by 10 to the 9, that means that at most, however m many uh, sort of bits we need in a binary number to represent this number, when all of them are turned to 1, that's the maximum value that we can have for x. So if we convert this to a binary, we end up with this, which is basically uh, 30 bits. And so you can imagine that if our first value was 10 to the 9, um, and then we slowly iterated through the rest of our values in our array. At some point, we might end up turning all of our zero bits to one bits. And at this point, it doesn't matter any of the other values that we are bitwise oring this value with. It's always going to stay at 31s. You can't increase it past that. Once a bit is set to one, it's going to stay at one. And so once they're all set to one, we can sort of exit our loop. So the first optimization was I basically uh, took this binary number here 
and converted it to a decimal number, which is this value right here. And so I basically added these two lines. I just calculated what's the maximum possible value that we could get based on our 10 to the 9 limit. And then if at any point we hit that in our inner loop, we just break out because we know that this line here isn't going to do anything for us at this point. Um, so that resulted in uh, the test case that I was failing passing, but then I ended up failing another test case, which was basically uh, it still had um, you know 50,000 elements, but none of them resulted in this maximum being hit. So you still end up doing the full uh, quadratic sort of operations. Um, and so the next thing that I thought was, well, maybe I can just calculate the maximum based on the input. So uh, in if you don't have a value that's you know in the range of 10 to the 9, that's going to end up with all 30 bits set, maybe you can calculate what is the actual maximum that you could possibly have based on the elements in your array and use that as the maximum. Uh, so that led to sort of the third attempt, which was this here. So I've only uh, added one more line and changed how we sort of set M. So we initialize this to be equal to sort of the maximum value of an integer. Uh, you could also set this to the maximum element in your array, either or works. And then basically after your first iteration of this loop, you're going to have the maximum value that X can ever get to because you're, you've taken the bitwise or of every single element in your array. And so you basically check at the end here, you know, this isn't very nice code, but it's just illustrating the steps that I went through. Um, if the, you're in your first iteration, set M, your maximum sort of bitwise value that you can end up with equal to your X, and then you have the same condition here. If at any point, uh, your sort of running bitwise value is equal to this maximum, you can break out because you know, once again, that these operations aren't going to end up creating any new values for you. And I didn't actually think that this was going to pass because this is technically still a quadratic algorithm. You can find a use case where regardless of what this maximum is, um, you can still end up, uh, like for most of the cases, not hitting this maximum. Um, but believe it or not, I guess they didn't have a test case for that and this ends up passing. Um, so this shows you how, you know, initially I wasn't exactly sure how to solve this problem or whether, you know, quadratic would be fast enough. Um, but just by sort of approaching the problem and trying to solve it in a, a method that I thought might work and then sort of tweaking that method, you can end up with a valid solution. So I have also shown, um, or I guess let's talk about the time complexity. So the time complexity, as I mentioned, is still quadratic uh, because you can find a use case where you're, you're still going to end up, for the most part, uh, going throughout the loop and not hitting this break very often. Um, so I would call this sort of optimized quadratic because obviously it's faster than our original solution, um, but it still is quadratic. It doesn't drop to n log n or linear or anything like that. And on the next couple slides, I have some more modern versions of this. So uh, this is a uh, version of the original algorithm that I showed that didn't pass, um, except it's using sort of a bitwise or modifying lambda, generic lambda from C++14. Um, and it also makes use of the uh, accumulate algorithm from the numeric library. So basically this is passing in uh, in the initial, the init list, uh, our set here so that we can insert to it. And then you have to make this lambda modifying by using the mutable keyword. And then you can just return uh, the bitwise or of the current two elements that you're looking at. And so you can pass this to our accumulate, uh, accumulate algorithm, uh, making sure to start at the uh, uh, second element and use the first element as our initial value. And if you do this, uh, you'll get the same result that our initial failing algorithm got. So it'll pass the uh, cases that don't have um, like 50,000 elements, uh, but it'll fail the cases that do have 50,000 elements. Um, but you can actually make a tweak. You can sort of modify the uh, STL accumulate and write your own that passes in a fourth uh, argument, which is just a predicate function that enables us to exit out of our accumulate um, if at any point we hit that maximum value that we pre-calculated. Uh, and note that this um, lambda doesn't actually need to be in here. It can be outside, but I fixed that in the next slide. So. 
uh, if we focus on just this function here, this is the same function we have, uh, except we're doing a little bit more work. So I would never implement this in the contest, but I think this is a nicer, more modern code. So we still have the same bitwise or here. I just shortened it um, so that it would fit on the screen better. And then we're calculating our value m by using the accumulate function and uh, initializing this with the first element and then looping through the whole. So this gets us our value m. And then we have this extra lambda expression that we're going to use as a predicate that basically just returns true if at any point the value that you've passed in is equal to this maximum. Um, and so then we have our same for loop, but uh, because we've moved the lambda outside, it looks slightly different. And then we're making a call to this accumulate fast, which is the exact same thing as accumulate. It just passes in this extra predicate here. And if we take a look at this function up here, accumulate fast, I basically just went to the uh, CPP reference website, uh, took what, what their sample implementation of accumulate. Uh, note, we can't use the std move because that doesn't come in until C++20. Uh, so I've removed that in the code up here. But basically, the only change that I've made to this is I've added an extra type name for our predicate type, uh, extra parameter, pred p, and then added this condition uh, that sort of ends the for loop that says and uh, the predicate is uh, returning false. Um, so when this, uh, so basically it says, you know, continue to loop as long as first doesn't equal last and that our predicate isn't uh, returning uh, true. And when our predicate does return true, we're going to end. And so this code uh, does actually pass if you try to submit it. So uh, this is the only code that I wrote today because uh, I felt like writing a little bit more C++ code than some Python and Java. Um, but yeah, I'll put both of these solutions that if you want to check out the more modern one and the one that just uses regular for loops in the uh, GitHub links. So check those out if you want to play around with them. Taking a look at the contest happening next week, we have six contests, so a lot busier than the previous week. On Wednesday and Thursday, we have two contests from Code Forces, Educational 50 on Wednesday and Round 507 on Thursday. On Friday, we have from Code Chef the start of our uh, week-long plus long challenge, and we also have the uh, start of our two-day university code sprint from Hacker Rank. I typically don't uh, include these in the schedule, but it's been so long since we've had a contest from uh, Hacker Rank that's been rated that I uh, decided to include an unrated one. One. So this won't affect your ranking, um, but you can compete in it if you'd like to. On Saturday, we've got from Hacker Earth the September Easy Contest, and of course we have from Leak Code the weekly Leak Code Contest, uh, Contest 101. As always, if you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, hit that like button. If you want to see more, make sure to hit that subscribe button. You can follow me on Twitter for reminders 30 minutes before contest start, and you can find all of the code shown in my videos on my GitHub page. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.